Um, I want to say good afternoon to everybody. Today, we're going to be looking together at uh, daily, is uh, you know, a, a very interesting conversation about uh, expressing Christ's life daily. Is it possible? How is it possible? Uh, and we started a series on looking at life through Christ's lens. And we want to say, how does this really work? How do we grow in, in our you know, understanding of Christ? How do we go in that relationship? And how you know, are we able to ensure that every day in our lives, we are facing life and making, you know, having expressions uh, as if Jesus Christ truly lives on our inside because he does. Uh, so today I'm going to be sharing a slide with us. I'll share my slide and we'll take that conversation uh, on from there. Uh, hopefully some of us will be able to contribute, you know, basically had a few thoughts here and there. Uh, I, would, I will also, you know, give the opportunity for us to be able to share. So daily experience of the life of Christ uh, today, that's what we're going to be talking about. And I will try and keep the com comments and, uh, you know, just a view of everything so that uh, I, can, I can get you involved in this conversation. Now, something very interesting uh, happens when we give our lives to Christ. And I'd like us to start with that interesting journey. So uh, I know many of us listen to the gospel many times before we accepted the gospel. Many of us heard the message, we were going to church, we had people preaching to us, if different things happened to us before we finally came to Christ. And this may be some sort of a description of what happened in our lives. We heard before and it had no effect. So, you know, what happens to us when we hear God's word and it has no effect? Is it because God's word is not potent? Is it because we are not ready? Is it because the word was not shared with fire? Is it because the person that shared it was not anointed? I'm sure all of us have had a situation where we heard the, the word of God, the gospel was preached, but he had no effect. And then of course it happened with us as well, that one day we heard and something happened. You know, and I'm, and I'm trying to build this story because all of us find our lives at certain portions of our journey today, and we may have forgotten how we started. Today by God's grace, I want to teach uh, from God's word, I want the Holy Spirit to inspire and teach us and open our eyes to some very basic truths so that we can live lives that express Jesus Christ on a daily basis. So one day, finally, you heard that gospel and something radically changed in your life. You knew that this was not listening to the message again like you had before. This was new. This was different. This was not the standard message you had ever listened to. Something happened on that particular day. And I don't know if you remember your own day. I remember my day, I was a teenager, I'd gone and listened to God's word and thought that there was an effect for many times until this particular day. This particular day, I knew that it was a commitment I was making. I knew something was different. I knew that this word, I will not forget. And this, this word that I heard is as far back as 30 years ago. So 30 years ago, I heard a message. Uh, I remember where it was preached, it was in a Baptist church. It was a foreign preacher who was asked to come around who shared a very interesting story. I cannot remember the details, but I remember that there was a bridge in America that collapsed over that bridge and killed many people. And their future was not certain because when they left their house that morning, they had not entered into a relationship with God. I heard that story. I, there was an altar call. I raised up my hand. I moved forward in the church. I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. That day, for the first time, after many times of hearing God's word, there was something interesting that happened that changed me. And what happened? What happened was that the word was mixed with faith in us and we believed. If you are here today and you have had that experience of the word of God being mixed with faith in you and you believed, can you just type in that chat box there, I believed. You know, all of us started our journey of faith by believing. God did the saving initiative. God sent Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. All the work that needed to be done for our salvation was single-handedly handled on God's end and on God's side. But you and I had one simple responsibility, and it was to believe. The word was shared, and we believed. Okay? We believed. And the moment we believed, at that instant, something fundamentally changed in our nature. And ladies and gentlemen, we, you know, we live in a world where you, know, you want to just look at everybody who comes to church, 
and say to them, you need, you need to be living better. You know, you need to be praying. You need to be reading your Bible. You need to be, you know, stop drinking, stop humanizing. And there are so many things we want people to do, but we are oblivious to as that instant, as that fundamental change in their nature as it occurred. You know, have these people encountered the Holy Spirit? Have these people come into contact with the word of God as it mixed with faith in them? Have they believed? And ladies and gentlemen, there can be behavioral change without salvation, okay? There can be an attempt to be moral without having the life of Christ birthed in us. We can attempt to do things to copy or imitate the people around us. The reality around us may force us into a space where we feel that we should stop doing the things that we are doing. And then when we get to another environment, we begin to do the things that we ought not to be doing. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, something happened to you and I, it wasn't do's and don'ts. It was a walk of faith. We heard the gospel, we recognized what Jesus Christ had done, and even though we didn't have absolute understanding of the details and the technicalities, we didn't know Genesis, Exodus, Heretical, all to Numbers and Deuteronomy, we didn't know all of those details, but something happened in our hearts and all of us can testify, we are witnesses of a change that happened in our heart at salvation. Okay, and there's a scripture, there's a verse of scripture that defines how that new life began. And I'd like us to examine that new life today. I like the way it says in New King James Version, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, all things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. And ladies and gentlemen, there is no way you and I can make new things happen, and there's no way new things will happen and all things will pass away, except there is a new creation. Uh, I'd like us to understand what exactly does this mean? Because if you look at life, there's no other human being in this world that anybody ever claims to be in, okay? Nobody says he's in Buddha. Nobody says he's in his mentor. Nobody says he's in his man of God. There's nobody we respect to the extent that we're able to describe the relationship we have with them as in them, okay? So there must be something very interesting about what it means to be in Christ and why the Bible chooses exactly that phraseology to express our relationship with Jesus. It says we are in him. And for this to gain, you know, for us to gain understanding about this, we need to examine what does it mean to be in Christ. Last week we talked about being in Christ, being, being dressed up in Christ, wearing him as cloth. But let's look very deeply at this word and say, where else in scripture? Was it ever used that we are in someone? Is there any reference to being in David? Is there any reference to being in Paul? Is there any reference to be in anything other than Christ? I will find that in the entirety of scripture, there are only two people that are ever referenced that we are in, okay? And I would like you, somebody can remind me of the other person in scripture that the Bible shows that demonstrates or writes that we are in, anybody. Fastest finger, this is Bible study. Okay, is there any Bible scholar here? Is there anywhere in scripture where there's a human being that was described that we were in? Because I find that in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, of course in the Bible more than 81 times, is there any other human identity that we were ever found in? In scripture, out of scripture, is there anybody that we're in? I'm not getting any response today. It's like uh, the Bible scholars in the house uh, meditating on God's word and trying to find the answers. Okay, please do me the favors of, Right now, even if you're not sure, somebody says in Christ only. Okay, uh, Grandma Yambuli says in Christ only. Anybody else? Any reference to scripture that we were in? Anybody else? Is there anybody, anybody, any human being, any structure, anything that we find that we were in? Anybody? Okay, is there anybody? And I, want to, I want to give us some time so that somebody says Abraham. Okay, <laughs> Abraham. Okay, uh, yes, there was a reference. There was a reference to somebody being in Abraham, not us being in Abraham. Okay, there was a reference to somebody being in Abraham, actually, that Levi was in Abraham. Okay, good. The answer is Adam. Okay, please let me put your hands together for Emma. She finally fished it out. Adam. Now, the Bible makes reference that the reason why we are sinners is because when Adam sinned, we were included in him. Being the first man in our creation, the fact that the first man and the first of God's creation in the lineage of, a of, of Adam, because Adam sinned, we also became inheritors of that sin in Abraham. That was the first 
Ada. Interestingly, there is no other reference to anybody being in anybody until Christ. And that is for you to understand that in the same way that you and I became joint heirs of sin on account of Adam, on account of his fall, we fell. On account of his, of his disobedience, we all disobeyed. In sin did our mothers conceive us. We entered into the lineage of sin on the account of Adam. That was God's first creation. Now, guess what? The Bible says when a man is in Christ, if anybody is in Christ, he is a new creation. What exactly is he saying? He's saying that now we have the opportunity not of being in Adam. We are in Christ. The Bible describes Jesus and says one of his names is that he shall be called everlasting father. Now, under his nature as everlasting father, he fathers a new creation. And on the merit of his own sacrifice and on the basis of what he did, we also, the same way we entered into sin by one man's fall, we have entered into righteousness and salvation on account of one man's right doing. That Jesus Christ became the first in the creation of people who have a new nature, who are no longer alienated from God and separated from the commonwealth of Israel, but who have entered into a new relationship and were birthed after the order of Christ, not by biology, not by sperm fertilizing egg, but by a new creation, which is, you know, the spirit and God's word roving over, you know, and then igniting a new life. Bible says that is born of the flesh is flesh. Anybody who is born of the spirit is spirit. And what happens with us in Christ Jesus is that we are born anew as new creations. It means that the same way God in the beginning created something from nothing, created the known world and declared things to be and formed man, you and I are part of a new creation. And that creation is in Christ. I'd like us to understand this. That the same way I cannot argue that I am not a sinner because I didn't do anything wrong, but because the wrongdoing was transferred into my race by the first sin, the same way you and I have become heirs of righteousness, we have become heirs of God's kingdom, we have become joint, heir with, joint heirs with Christ, we are saved, okay, it, and, and, and made right with God not by virtue of anything that we did, but because the person through whom we were born, the person whose lineage we are in, created a pathway for us to be a part of his creation. I don't know today if you are excited that you are in Christ and you are a new creation. If you are here today, you are excited, you are in Christ and you are a new creation, you can type in that chat box, I am a new creation. And ladies and gentlemen, this new creation you are has nothing to do with your good behavior has nothing to do with your moral muscle, has nothing to do with your history, has nothing to do with your present, has nothing to do with your future. It has no bearings on you. It has no bearings on the reality of anything that you did. It is totally the work of grace, totally, absolutely the work of God. And you are a new creation means you cannot enter into your own creation. You cannot create yourself. You have been created anew by God. That this is work that God alone does. And this work does only, does, doesn't only affect our positioning, it interestingly also affects our character. And our ability to become new creations and becoming new people is not a function of what we instigated or what we stirred or what we started. It is based on the finished work of Christ. That by virtue of what he did, he placed himself in a new order as the firstborn of many children, and you and I are in his lineage, okay? We are his posterity who will declare his generation. After Jesus Christ, every begat, begat, begat from the lineage that connects Abraham, you know, Adam to Abraham, Abraham to David to Jesus ended because he didn't give birth biologically. But in that order were created people who are born of the spirit, who are born of faith, who by virtue of the word of God that was planted in their hearts, mixed with faith and belief, became new creatures. All things passed away and a new beginning began. Amen. A new beginning began. And I will look at other versions of that scripture, how they put the same thing as well. So we have an understanding. It says, if anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, the old life is gone, a new life has begun. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living a new life. 
from the moment you said yes to Jesus, a new life was born. Now, this new life was born not because of the quality of what was said only, but because what was said mixed with belief, mixed with faith. That what takes, you know, for any birth to happen, there's first the sperm and then there is the egg. And it is when th that fertilization happens, that's when a baby is born. In the same way, Christ started to be ignited in you and I, the moment the word of God, which is an incorruptible seed, was planted on our hearts and mixed with the soil of faith in our hearts. It was mixed with faith in our hearts. It birthed a new life. Okay, we are in Christ. We are now new persons. We are not a better version of our old self. No, we are new people. We are completely new, completely made, completely remade. The life we now have, you know, with the Holy Spirit living on our inside is a completely different life from the one that we had before. And if this experience never became your internal experience, the best thing that we can do is try and copy it, is try and make it happen on our own. That will not be this life. He says, now we look inside. And what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start, is created new. The old life is gone, a new life emerges. And ladies and gentlemen, I am excited today that I have the opportunity and the privilege of living a new life. A new life has begun with me. A new life begins with me. I am created new. Okay, I am fresh. There's a freshness that comes with coming into Christ. It is a freshness. It's a newness. Okay, it's something like a baby is like a baby is formed on your inside. A new life is formed. A new life takes its bearing, takes its creation, takes its formation, takes its ancestry from Christ. It becomes our everlasting father. All of us, irrespective of our age, when we say we are born again, it means a new baby Christ is now resident on our inside. And that new baby Christ is a new life open to the ability to follow God, open to the opportunities to obey God, open to the opportunities not no longer to be enslaved to sin and live in the old country, but is relocated to a new country and is a fresh new birth, open to begin to write afresh on, afresh on the tablets of, of their mind and of their experience, a new nature. Something radically different happened to us at salvation, uh, but it was a new baby. That new baby is a new template. It's a new page. It's a new page in a new book, okay? And that new page, you have the ability now to write on it. All the handwritings that were written against you, all the things that your ancestors did, all the things that were in your family lineage, all the things that were the reason why you will not succeed in life or you will not make progress in this life because of ancestral causes were cancelled. They were nailed to the cross. You were given a fresh start as a new creation. Everything, every cause that was legitimate and was the inheritance of your family, you know, changes track, loses account of you because you've been transported from that kingdom into a new kingdom. You are a new creation. And that starting afresh is how we all started afresh. We heard the word of faith. It landed upon the soul of our heart. It was mixed with faith. The soil was fertile. The soil was prepared, and it gave birth to new life. Now, what exactly is this new life? This new life uh, that Jesus promised us, what are the constituents of this new life? Jesus Christ described the life that he came to give us in John 10, 10b. Okay, he says, the thief came to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Now, in message transition, it says, I came so that they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know the kind of life that you dream of. You know, and sometimes when we talk, we may sound a little bit pious and feel as if life is just based on our spiritual journeys with God and our eternity in heaven. This life starts from here. This life is all-encompassing. This life covers your marriage. This life covers your personal career, your business, your vocation. This life covers your relationship with your friends. This life covers your children. This life covers you toe and toe, covers your finances, covers you know, the, the, the growth and your fulfillment and satisfaction over your children and grandchildren. This life is a better life than you ever dreamed of. And I, I want us to be very real with ourselves this morning and ask ourselves, or this evening and ask ourselves, what kind of life do I dream of? 
What kind of life do I want to live? And yes, all of us have a hope. We are all held out by a hope of an eternity with God where we fellowship with him and we live with him. But God takes delight in our delight. God is excited to see us happy. The same way a father looks at the son and sees that the son is coming first to school. The same way a father looks at the son and sees that the son can now recite the ABC. The son can now count one to hundred. The same way the father looks at the son with pride and joy because of a child's excitement and fulfillment, God rejoices over you when you accomplish the key milestones in your life. God who put a desire in you to desire some things wants to delight in your delight. He wants you to achieve those milestones, to do those beautiful things. He wants to look at you and see you smile and know that this is a better life than you ever dreamed of. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing is left out in God's promise of the kind of life that he wants us to have. He says so they can have real and eternal life. A life that is real, a life that is eternal, a life that starts getting lived from here and is better than any life that you ever dreamed of. Okay, Mr. St. John says it this way. He says, I've come, this is the NKJV, that he may have life and have it more abundantly. So Jesus Christ promises us an abundant life. And I don't know what is the constituent of your abundant life. What does it mean when life is abundant? And I think you can take a few notes down and say, if my life was abundant, you know, if I, if I, was, if I was enjoying abundant life, what kind of life would that be? Would that be a life where I am only looking forward to eternity? Or is it a life where I'm looking at what I'm, you know, I'm looking at what's going on and I'm saying, you know what, well, this is life in its abundance. I am enjoying an abundant life. He says, I have come that he may have life and have it more abundantly. NLT says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Now, Jesus Christ said, this is why I've come. I've come so that they can enjoy a rich and satisfying life. A life that is rich and satisfying. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what God desires for us. This is what he delights that becomes our reality. And what exactly are the elements of his life? Is this life just a life that has money? Is that what satisfying life means? Is it a life that, that is famous and popular? Is that what satisfying life is? Is it a life that is influential and impactful? Is it a life that is bold and courageous? Is it a life that is full of beauty, you know, and is exciting? God wants you and I to have a satisfying life. And, you know, we want to ask ourselves, what exactly does this mean? What does it mean when a life is really, really satisfying? What is the implication of a satisfying life? What exactly does it mean? Okay, to say that my life is satisfying. You know, I'm excited and satisfied by the life. Let's look at it very quickly. Now, I had a few parameters here, you know, defining what the abundant life looks like. And these are 10 key elements of the abundant life. One is a life of confidence, okay? Reality is, if we are following Jesus, we will not live like the world. The world is unsure. The world is, is not clear. People in the world are complaining about Buhari one day and complaining about Jonathan one day and saying one is better and saying this is good and saying this is bad. They, they lack confidence, okay? When you are in Christ, when you have this abundant life and you have the Holy Spirit guiding you, you can make your decisions with boldness. You can know that you don't need to stress yourself because you know that he leads you. Okay, you know that he guides you, you know that he's involved in your journey. You and I can enjoy a confident life. You know, we can be bold. We can tell people, don't worry, everything is going to be all right in Nigeria. Not because everything looks all right, but because we have a relationship with God that assures us and secures us. The world cannot buy confidence. You and I can enjoy this confidence of knowing that our lives are in the right direction, of knowing that everything is working together for our, for our good is part of the abundant life. In this abundant life, we enjoy, we have joy. This joy is not based on happenings, okay? They say happiness responds to happenings. Joy is internal. That God is able to grant you and I joy that the world cannot comprehend. That we can be bubbling over with excitement based on a revelation that God gave us and everything around may be falling apart, but we have this great joy. The Bible says, in the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That you and I can enter into the movie of life, understanding that the end of the movie, it ends in joy. Bible says, Jesus, for the joy is set before him, endured the cross, despising his shame. It means that you and I know that we are held out by hope of a joy set before us. And because this joy is so magnanimously set before us, there is nothing in the present, neither principality nor power, 
There's nothing, thinkable or unthinkable, that can shake our resolve because we know that our joy doesn't come from happenings. It comes from within, okay? We are in tandem with God in this joy. We also experience his peace, okay? His deeper inner peace that the world doesn't understand. The Bible calls it the peace that passes all understanding. It means this peace is not based on logic. This, this peace is not susceptible to calculations. It is not something you can analyze and say, ah, okay, I understand why you are at peace. No, this peace is beyond, is beyond understanding, okay? We gain this peace when we continually follow Jesus. The peace is based on our faith in Jesus. It's always, you know, he has a plan in place. And we know that even when things go rough, when things turn around for the worst, we know that in every situation, Jesus Christ can be magnified. That's why Paul can be in prison and you still be writing one of the most amazing letters. He can be in prison and you will say, you know, I'm excited because here God is made known and I'm rejoicing. Okay, we enjoy that peace. This abundant life is a powerful life. This power, this, Jesus Christ says, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Judea. He says, this sign will follow those who believe in my name, they will cast out demons. You know, one of the rights that we have as believers, one of the things that Jesus Christ gives us is power in his name. The Bible says you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Ladies and gentlemen, in this abundant life, it's not a grief-tending life. It's not a life that is, that is shy and subdued. It's a life that demonstrates God's power. When you and I see people that are sick, something within you should desire, let me lay hands and pray for this one. When we see things that are happening in order, let's be able to say, you know what, this business is not going all right. I want to pray about it. You know, this family is not going together. There is power available. We don't just have God's word alone. We don't have God's peace alone. We don't have God's joy alone. We have power. God's power is unleashed on those who are obedient to him and who follow him. We have access to power. It's part of the dimension of this abundant life that we enjoy as well. And then, of course, the life of beauty. Okay? God, imagine this. God made the universe. God created all the beautiful things we can see. God is a God that creates beautiful things. The Bible says we are wonderfully made. He made the butterflies. He made the birds. He clothed the peacock. God is the one behind nature, dressing the lion with his manes, making the horse look, you know, the way the horse looks. God, you know, creates beautiful things. And God wants to beautify your life and my life as well. He wants us to have sweet stories, sweet testimonies, things that people listen to are like, wow, I like to have a relationship with this God. God wants our lives to be beautiful. And this abundant life is also full of beauty as well. It's a spiritual beauty. It's a physical beauty. It's a soulish beauty. People that experience us taste goodness. We are a breath of fresh air. This is what our life should be characterized by. Fulfillment. How can you be fulfilled when you don't know where your life is heading? You know, many people in the world, 50, 60, 70, are still trying to discover and discern the purpose of God for their lives. You and I have the opportunity of living fulfilled, knowing that God's purpose for our life, we know what it is, and we are living it. The Bible says he created us for his workmanship, work we had better be doing. You know, you and I derive joy, knowing that one day we'll stand before God and he will say, good and faithful servant. Because we have lived lives that have not only expressed him, but have demonstrated him. We have shown, we have expressed his love. We have become channels for expressing his love to others. Okay, and we are playing our own part in changing the world around us, in influencing the community around us. I can go on and on. Hope, love, a life with God, a life without stress and anxiety. Okay, so since God is love, we follow the one who loves us perfectly and we become channels to express his love to others. We experience his love, we enjoy his love and become channels to, you know, to, to, to give it to others as well. Now, this is what the abundant life looks like. If you are here today and this abundant life, you want it to be your life in full, in full, in full HD. You don't want to live in black and white. You don't want to live in colored. You want to live the fullness of this abundant life, not once in a while, but every day. Can you just type in that chat box there? Amen. And I like to say amen to that. Amen to living life in those terms. Amen to living like that. Thank you very much, Mrs. Obulese. Okay, I can see your amen. Okay. And I hope we're all here listening. God wants an abundant life for you. He wants an abundant life in your home. 
your family. It needs to be abundant. It's not abundant life. It's not people falling sick here and there. It's people, it's the power of God being present to heal the sick. And abundant life is a life, not a shy, gritting life. It's a life of boldness, knowing that I have confidence. I have hope. I am without stress or anxiety. And abundant life is not a life that is worrying about what will I eat tomorrow? What will happen there after tomorrow? God is not interested in your being impoverished. You know, there's no way you're going to look at it. If you look at the extremes of poverty, you will know that God cannot desire poverty for you. And abundant life is not a life that is struggling to keep up. It's a life that is beautiful, that is attractive, that basically, you know, gives a very good aura about God. I want to bring people into that knowledge. Of course, there will be persecution. Of course, there will be people that don't agree with your faith. Of course, there will be challenging times and challenging situations where God will use to develop you. But this is the abundant life that God wants. Now, how is this life worked out within us? How do you become participants in this exciting life? Okay, Paul was praying for the Galatian church in Galatians 4.19. He says, oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. And they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. Now, this verse gives us a little insight into something interesting. That Christ became alive in us. We came into Christ, became new creature, and a new life was born. But this new life is in its infancy. And Paul says, I am like a mother in childbirth. This time around, I'm not laboring to give birth to a baby. I'm laboring for Christ to grow in you. I'm laboring for Christ to be magnified in you. I'm laboring for Christ in you to become the glory of the world. I'm laboring for Christ in you to come to full stature so that you can express him. I are not children tossed to and fro by every way of doctrine, but you are standing mature in full capacity. You are not Jesus at 12. You are not Jesus at 18. You are not Jesus at 19. You are not Jesus at 29. But you are manifesting Jesus at 30. A point in his life where he had developed into full stature and he was ready to express his ministry. Paul says, for you, I am praying as his children. I mean, labor as it were until Christ is formed in you. Ladies and gentlemen, Christ wants to be fully formed in you. Christ wants to become more and more in you. And you and I understand that even though we have a new creature on our inside, our flesh has not changed. When you look in the mirror, when you are saved, it's still the same person there. The girlfriend you had, it's still the girlfriend you had. The bottle of beer you had in the fridge and the wine you had in the fridge, it's still what you had in the fridge. The contracts you are signed were still signed. The deals you are doing were still in progress. But now you are becoming new, a new child of faith, and Christ begins a journey of growth within you as you make yourself vulnerable enough for people that will pray with you. And as you make yourself available to God, you know, for that image of Christ and the personality of Christ to come to full stature. Now we know how Jesus Christ came to full stature. It becomes the journey of our lives as well. But we realize that this work is going on our inside. And how did this work start in the first instance? This work started in the first instance by hearing the word and that word being mixed with faith. So how, God, how does God work in us? You know, I saw a very interesting verse. And interestingly, this verse was read again this morning, but this verse has been doing me in since last week when I read it again in the, in the devotion that we're going through. You know, e e Ephesians 3, 20, and I think I like particularly the message transition. It says, God can do anything, you know. This is from verse 16, there's a prayer. It said, I kneel before the Father of heaven and earth, you know, that he wants you to understand the dimensions of God's love, that you be filled with the fullness of God. And then it comes to verse 20, and this verse 20 is, is, is causing palpitations in my heart. He says, God can do anything, you know. You know, somebody say with me, God can do anything. God can do anything. Now, God can do anything, you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like us to pause a little while here. Okay? This is very, very interesting. God can do anything, you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. I'd like us to hold it there. And let's do a little experiment, ladies and gentlemen. What is, what, you know, what exactly is what you want to imagine? What do you want to guess? Or what will you request for in your wildest dreams? And if I can be, if I can be real with you, you know, there are people in this place today who in their wildest dreams, what they will require is God. I want my children to know you. Some people in their wildest dreams will say, I want my children to be impactful for your kingdom. Some of us will say, my business that I'm doing, I want to achieve something that I know is not possible. I know that the time I have left to do this kind of results, I can't really achieve this in the period of time that is remaining. 
Some of us will say, my marriage, I don't like you, my marriage is, I will love if my husband will love me so much more than he loves me now and really, really love me. Or I will love for my wife, you know, to really be where real things want to ask God. There are things in our wildest dreams, in our wildest guesses, in our wildest imaginations. You are saying, I want my children to be the best that they can be in their vocation, in their career. This is what I want to happen. I want this to happen to my family, for my brother, my sisters, my siblings. You know, I want healing for this person. This person has been, you know, been, been, been yoked for 18 years and has been bent. I want God to lift up this daughter of Abraham and stretch her out. This is what I would like you to do. Ladies and gentlemen, we have plenty of things that we want God to do. Do I have a witness in the house today? If I have a witness in the house today, you can say, you know, yes, I'm a witness. Okay? So, there are things we want. And, and let's be real. Yeah? There are things that we really would desire that God could do if we knew that God could do them. You know? There are things we... The Bible says God can do anything, you know? Anything. This, this is basically flipping around and saying there is nothing impossible for God. Nothing impossible for God. And he can do not just anything. He can do anything far more than you can imagine. Far more. Okay, somebody is there, doesn't have a job, God can do anything. Somebody is there, needs healing, God can do anything. Somebody is there, needs healing in their families, God can do anything. Somebody is there looking up to God to say, God, you know, I have this depth, I want it clear. God can do anything. And he can do it far more than you can imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. But how does he do it? Bible says he does it not by pushing us around, but by walking within us. His spirit deeply and gently within us. How does God make you more desirous of reading the Bible? How does God make you more? How does God improve your prayer life? How does God increase your business? How does God promote you in your career? How does God advance you to be able to accomplish what you set out to accomplish? How does God help to ensure that the projects you have in your mind can be done? He doesn't do it by pushing you around. He doesn't do it by saying, go here, go there, come here, come there. He doesn't push it by you having more to do and for you to labor on and labor hard. He does it by, by walking within us. His spirit deeply and gently within us. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you sense the spirit, but this is how God works. Everything God wants to manifest in your reality is started on your inside. God doesn't start on your outside. You are not pulled by waves of doctrine. You are not pulled by wheels of insight. You, the work starts on your inside. That work starts on your inside. Your work of growing in Christ Jesus starts on your inside. It doesn't start on the outside. It starts on your inside. Your work of maturity starts on your inside. What God does is that his Holy Spirit deeply and gently begins to work within you. Now, remember, the first thing we said, when we become a new creature, you become a new creature. You know, says, any man is in Christ. And I said in Christ is something we don't use for any other man. We are in Christ in multiple metaphors. We are in Christ. When God looks at him and sees him as righteous, we are in him. We are in Christ like the children of Noah were in the ark. Once you are in Christ, even if your behavior in the ark doesn't make any sense, if you are in that ark, you are in the ark. Okay? You are in him. Just like the scripture says, if you are in me and abide in me, you know, like you are like a branch of a vine. My life flows through you. You will bear my fruit. Your only responsibility is stay in me. Okay? Now, and once we stay in him, he works in us not by hanging Christmas tree fruit on us, but by walking within us, by walking deeply and gently within us. KJV says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according, according to the power that works in us. His power is at work within us. NLT says, now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power to work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we may ask or think. Ladies and gentlemen, how does God work in us? It starts from our inside. And let's pay attention to this. It starts from our inside. It starts with the desire. So you are praying to God and say, God, I want to work. I want to love you more. I want to serve you more. I want to be, you know, I want to be useful to your hand. Make me an instrument of your peace. Make me an instrument. You know, use me, God. It starts with a desire. It starts with a desire. And that desire, you back it up with a choice. Because the same way we are saved is that when God's word came, there was a desire in our hearts to say, there's something in this calling you. And we responded to that choice by standing up. And then it was fueled 
by faith developed from the word that we heard. So first there was a desire, and then the word came and it was mixed with faith. We responded with prayer, okay? And then we are moved into action for expression of love and service. And then in our work and obedience with God and in relationship with him is cultivated, God begins to mature us and Christ begins to grow in us. And in every area of life where we seek God's face and desire that he does something significant, he begins and births a work in us, we realize that it is not God, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not us doing anything, it is us responding to God. That is our response to God. That God initiates the work, God finishes the work, he gives an opportunity to respond. In simple terms, God works in us as we trust in him. God works in us as we trust in him. Everything described there about our Bible study, about our prayer, about our development of faith, about our working with God in obedience is in summary, trusting in God. And I want to challenge us this evening and say, do you trust God? Do you trust in God sufficiently to know that even this life of imitating Christ, this life of walking and seeing from his perspective is a journey that happens only by trust? That there's a choice you need to make. There's a choice you need to make. There's a choice you have been empowered to be able to make the moment you became a new creature. And that choice, that power, okay, that, that ability became installed when you accepted Jesus. And that power is the ability to choose to trust God. Because yes, he's the one that works in us. And you and I have the opportunity to simply trust him. And I want to ask you today, do you trust God? Do you trust God that he will help you grow in him? Do you trust God that he will open the scriptures to you and you will find revelation for the things he has promised? Do you trust God that he will hold you by the hand and teach you the things that you ought to know? Do you trust God that for that business you are doing, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above your wildest dreams and imaginations? Do you trust God that in that family are building that God is able to install love in that family and make you work together as a team? Do you trust God that even though you have grown and advanced in years, that God can revive you again and put you on fire for him and make you impactful to lives around? Do you trust God that God is able to supply all your needs according to his riches in glory? And beyond supplying your needs, God is able to make you a source of blessings to others. Do you trust God that you can look at your neighborhood and you can begin to organize to say once in a week, I want to begin to make a difference and feed my neighborhood. Or once in a year, I want to begin to give scholarships to 50 children. Do you trust God that God can make you useful to him to impact many lives? Ladies and gentlemen, you and I know that our academic qualifications are not required for discipling others. Our degrees are not a necessary requirement for being able to impact many souls. Our history of faith is not what is required. Our 30 years of salvation, 25 years of salvation, 10 years of salvation are not requirements. The Samaritan woman in one day, in a few hours, was able to become a witness for Jesus in Samaria. That you and I have nothing disqualifying us, everything qualifying us. We are not the old creation anymore. We are a new creation. But the life of God, this work of the Holy Spirit on our inside is ignited by trust. And we need to learn to trust him. And how do we learn to trust him? Ladies and gentlemen, there's already an area of your life where you have trusted him. Somebody shared with me recently, he said the same faith that cures headache is the same faith that raises the dead. And if you and I believe that the same faith that we have used for our headache, year in, year out, is the same faith required for raising the dead, is the same faith required for having a beautiful family, is the same faith required for blowing that business, is the same faith required for, for, for impacting those children. It's the same faith required for discipling your neighborhood. It's the same faith required for discipling your nation. It's the same faith required to enter into a joyous, pleasurable relationship with God where you are not forcing things, but you are moved to read the Bible by pure delight and pure pleasure. The same faith that you use for the small things is the same faith that you use for whatever it is that is big. Because all that faith is, is in the form of a seed. And it carries its own life force it only needs to be planted on soil, and even a mustard seed can become a mighty oak tree that provides shelter for others. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to learn to trust God. We need to know that what God wants to do in your life is not outside in, it's inside out. And if you can place that desire in your heart, 
you need to just basically take his words back to him, take his promise to him, and say, this is what the abundant life looks like. This is what my life looks like. I want to live this Jesus abundant life on a daily basis. I want to be the person who expresses your love because I saw it in Jesus. I want to be the person that has the capacity to solve people's problems because I saw it in Jesus. I want to be the person who every day I go out, I'm in communion with God. I have clarity about the future and I'm impactful to the lives around me because I can see it in Jesus. We need to learn to trust him. Trust him. I like a definition I found. It says, what does it mean to trust God? It says, trusting God is more than a feeling. It's a choice. It's a choice to have faith in what he says, even when your feelings or circumstances would have you believe something different. Your feelings and circumstances matter, and they are very much worth paying attention to. God cares about them both, but those things alone are not reliable enough to base your life on. They can change at any moment, even in an instant. God, on the other hand, does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he's worthy of your trust. Okay? That I need to trust God. I can grow into the fullness. How do I come into the fullness of the nature of Christ? Of course, by trusting him. Trusting him means I will pray. Trusting him means I will read his word to get his point of view. Trusting him will mean I will make myself vulnerable to others who can pray for me. Trusting him means I will, I will look around my life and be grateful for the things that I ought to be grateful for. Trusting him means I will have no other logical, secondary, if God fails position. I will keep no fail safe. You know, all of us, averagely, have what we will do if God doesn't show up. God is not our last card. We have a backup. We have plan B. And that plan B is not trusting in God. Trusting in God needs to be your plan B. Trusting in God needs to be your plan A. Trusting in God means irrespective of what's happening around me, I choose to believe. I choose to have faith in what he has said. Ladies and gentlemen, choose to have faith. And God has said so many amazing things in his word. We look at the life of Jesus Christ and we see a quality life I want to live. We will not start this journey without faith. We will not grow in this journey without faith. We will not become all that we will, will, God wants us to become without trusting him. I need to trust that God will provide me opportunities to be like Jesus. I need to trust that when push comes to show, show in that moment of decision, I will choose what Jesus will do. I need to trust that my life will be like a shining light that shines brighter and brighter at the break of dawn. I need to trust God that my network, my skill sets, my abilities is not what's going to create the fireworks. That God is able to do anything. And he does it not by pushing me around, but by the gentle work of the Holy Spirit in me as I trust him to do so. So in closing today, you know, so many thoughts there. But our life of trust is expressed in seeking his view. In confessing our unbelief when we don't believe in being vulnerable to a community of people who pray for us. How many people are we praying for? How many people are praying for us? How many people know what is going on with us sufficiently to even pray for us? Paul said, pray for me. I'm in chains, pray for me. I have my limitations, pray for me. I have business deliverables, pay for, pray for me. I have things I'm looking forward to that God, I want God to do. And except we have that fellowship with one another, where we share what's going on with each other, we're not even vulnerable enough to be, you know, to, to, to be prayed for. And if we trust God, we know that God answers our prayers, but God also answers the prayer of saints. God answers the prayer of his children. And the fact that there are many people bringing your matters before God, you know, has, adds value to it. If I trust God, I will spend time with him. I will know I have no recourse. I have no other hope outside him. Anybody I trust, I will knock on their door. And that's with God. I spend time with God. I will look for reasons to be grateful. I will walk in the Holy Spirit. I will wait upon the Lord. And I want to encourage us today to trust God, to say this life of daily expression of, of Christ in every dimension of life is a journey of trust. It's a journey of believing that God will hold me by my hand and lead me forward. That God is there to rescue me, is there to help me, is there, you know, for me. So ladies and gentlemen, that's not what it is today. You know, the question today is, do we trust him? Are we willing to trust him? And we will need to trust him for every aspect of our lives. And I want to encourage you today, let's trust God. Let's trust him absolutely. And know that God is at work. And you know, many times we run into skelter. God doesn't push us around. 
whatever is pushing you around is your own personal agenda. God walks gently and quietly within us. He nudges us. He puts a desire in your heart. He puts a hunger for scripture. He puts a hunger for his word. And then you have a delight to spend time with him to say, God, I need, I need your help with this. I need to support me with this. And then from that space on, it mixes with faith. That word mixes with faith in your heart. And then it gives you an idea. It gives you clarity. It opens your mind to see something. And then what he wants to do on the outside, it begins on your inside. I pray that God will grant us grace to manifest Jesus every day, to live impactful lives, to live influential lives, to express God in love and in service, and not do it from the arm of our flesh or our moral muscle, but to do it the same way we came into this new creation, by faith. And at this same faith that made a shepherd boy become a mighty warrior, this same faith by which a harlot became you know, became a part of God's people and God's kingdom. This same faith, okay, that made Gideon of a tribe that was not of account become a mighty war leader, leading a few people into an army to conquer. This same faith by which Abraham decided to conceive when he was past age. <clears throat> this same faith. And this same faith will be found in you and you and I will simply walk with God and trust in God to do the unthinkable, to do the unimaginable, to do the unrequestable, to do beyond our wildest dreams. And I pray as we trust God, we will see his hand at work in our homes. We'll see that his hand at work in our lives. We'll see his hand at work in our businesses. We'll see his hand at work with our children. We'll see his hand at work in our ministry. We'll see his hand at work in every dimension of our lives. In Jesus' name. Let us pray.